Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Frank Miles. I, too, am a member of the committee that plans these lectures. And uh, our topic tonight, Advances in Neurosurgery and Stroke. And I will, now that I have been introduced, I will introduce someone else. This is Ed Nazareth. He is the Director of Clinical Education here. And he will tell us about each of the speakers. Ed? Now I get to introduce a few more people. But um, first, I hope you're all enjoying uh, another wonderful Miracle Living presentation here at Torrance Memorial. Just want to take a moment to thank a few people who have been helping us out with this. Uh, you, know, you see laboratory back there who's taking out your cholesterol checks. Um, rehab there telling you a little bit about our stroke um, support group and the many um, programs in rehab and, and therapy. Uh, we had the community education department who was checking your blood pressures. Uh, we had the imaging team who was displaying their ultrasound machine out there. And of course, our wonderful catering team that had uh, nice dark chocolate and orange treats for you guys, something healthy for uh, this event. So thank you for that. So without further ado, I just want to introduce our first speaker, uh, is uh, Marco Petsch. He's been with here at Torrance Morrill since 20, 2014. He has his Master's of Science in Nursing and has his National Board Certification in Stroke Nursing as well. And as our stroke coordinator, he's the guy that's, that's working with the physicians and nurses and therapists to help take care of you once you come in through the doors of stroke and take care of you throughout the entire continuum and make so you have a safe discharge. So I'll tell us a little bit about our program. Here's uh, Marco Pesch. Please give us a warm welcome. Thanks for the introduction, Ed. I appreciate that. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for coming. Just want to uh, you know, give a, a very big thank you to this community and the involvement that you guys have in our hospital and as well as in yourselves, family members, loved ones, whoever it may be. You know, this uh, information is very vital. Uh, it's very dear to my heart as being the stroke coordinator and seeing these patients come through our doors and be able to hopefully potentially treat them with this uh, kind of cutting edge technology and um, ideally have them go home with a safe discharge, which is nice to see. So thank you for all that. Uh, so now I just basically want to kind of cover a couple topics with us. And our topic is about uh, advancements in neurosurgery and stroke. And I just want to highlight some of the technologies that we use here at our hospital as well too in order to manage, treat these patients while they're here. Um, so today's topics will cover a little bit about um, what a stroke is, risk factors associated with stroke, signs and symptoms, and activating uh, 911 or EMS uh, if you suspect someone may be having a stroke. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about our stroke program overview, so program services and how we harness technology here in order to provide this cutting edge treatment uh, to our patients within the community. Uh, so just a little bit of stroke by the numbers. There's approximately 795,000 people who experience a stroke or a new or recurrent stroke each year. So it's, you know, over three quarters of a million people annually and about 75% of those are actually new strokes in fact. Uh, they account for about one out of every 19 deaths in the United States and they actually kill someone in the U.S. about every four minutes. So this is a very uh, debilitating disease process. Um, and fortunately, though, about 80% of these strokes can be prevented with the proper awareness, um, community events such as this, um, and conversations with family and primary care providers as well. Um, so when we consider um, strokes separately from other cardiovascular diseases, it ranks fifth. Now, it formerly was the third among all disease processes in the U.S., and the cause for that is, like I would mentioned before, community awareness, more education surrounding it, more acute interventions that are offered to uh, patients um, for, that are experiencing stroke potentially. Uh, it, unfortunately, it still is a leading cause of serious long-term disability in the United States. Um, it costs us about $34 billion annually when we look at healthcare expenditures and uh, wages, uh, lost wages due to um, not being able to return to work. So a lot of work that we still need to do and hopefully we can start to trend this in that direction of you know fifth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, things like that. That's what we hope for in the future. So what exactly is a stroke? Uh, it's a brain attack. So you have an attack in the heart, same thing. You have an attack in the brain. It occurs when blood flow to an area of the brain is cut off and deprived of oxygen and vital nutrients. Uh, this lack of blood flow, it can actually cause severe tissue injury and potentially irreversible damage uh, leading to cell death. Uh, so roughly 85% of these are going to be ischemic. The remaining 10 to 15% will be hemorrhagic in nature. So what does that look like? I have a couple images up here. So you can see this on the left right over here. This will be considered an ischemic stroke. You can see a blockage right in that artery right over there. 
And on the right side, you'll see your hemorrhagic shock over here. So that's going to be a rupture of one of these uh, blood vessels, um, and that leaks blood into that tissue. So you have your two types, your ischemic and your hemorrhagic. And within those, you have other subsets, um, and Dr. Evoli will kind of dive into deep on some of those acute interventions for those cases. Um, so what do stroke symptoms look like? What should you be looking for in yourself, uh, family, friend, someone in the community, maybe at the grocery store and notice something doesn't seem right with, with, with somebody? What are things that you want to look for? So it's going to be always sudden or acute onset and weakness, confusion, difficulty speaking, uh, problems understanding, so just uh, comprehension, like not really understanding what someone's telling you, uh, dizziness, balance and coordination problems as well too. Uh, any type of numbness, severe headache, this would be like the worst headache of your life type of headache that you would experience. Uh, trouble walking, and sometimes vision changes as well too. So this encompasses all the signs, and, or the majority of the signs and symptoms of stroke that we look for, and this will be acute onset. So what's the acronym that we like to use in the stroke world when it comes to stroke symptom recognition, uh, and how we can kind of remember a little bit easier, we like to use this BFAST acronym. So that's gonna be for, uh, B is for balance, E is for eyes, F is for face, arm is gonna be you know, upper and lower extremity weakness on one side of the body, uh, speech, difficulty with speech, and time. The big thing we like to focus on in the stroke world is gonna be time down here. When was that person last seen well? When were they last seen normal? And that gives us a lot of information, vital information, in order to appropriately triage and manage this patient and, and different pathways we can take once they come in through the hospital. So, you know, what do I do if my loved one or friend or, or someone that you see may be experiencing a stroke? So in the stroke world, we like to say time is brain. We want to make sure that you call 911 immediately. Um, don't drive into the hospital. Don't wait a little bit and see if the symptoms go away. Call 911 right away. So, you know, when it comes to stroke, it's okay to overreact. You know, we can have you worked up in the emergency department, and if everything is fine, then we'll send you home. But if not, then we can appropriately triage you, manage you. And the reason why I say why we call 911 is because we get pre-hospital notification. Ambulance arrives to the bed or to the door. Um, they kind of get a, a scenario, or kind of a feeling of what's going on, and they can alert us on the back end and help us prepare for these people to come into the uh, the emergency room. So it gives us kind of a head start. And like I mentioned, time is brain, so every minute matters. So what are the, some some of the top risk factors for stroke that we look at? Um, high blood pressure is going to be kind of the number one, and that goes for all stroke types. Uh, atrial fibrillation, this will be an irregular heart rhythm. In fact, this puts you at a five times greater risk for stroke. So it's very important that you talk with your primary care doctor, cardiologist, neurologist, and make sure you're on the appropriate type of anticoagulant if that's indicated for you. Uh, high cholesterol is another risk factor, diabetes and circulation problems. So these are kind of the, the typical risk factors that you'll see when it comes to stroke. So now I'll kind of dive a little bit, uh, that was kind of a, a quick uh, um, information session on, on, on stroke, but now I'll get into the stroke program and what do we do here at Torrance Amaro that sets us apart from everyone else. Um, well, first I'd like to thank uh, kind of this organization, the hospital, and nursing, physicians, staff, and everyone who's involved. To, we had this recently come out in Newsweek in 2019 as one of the world's best hospitals. So you can see it, top non-academic hospital in the U.S., 8th in California, and 38th overall in the U.S. So, you know, I feel very comfortable, you know, living in this community and having this hospital in my backyard. So I just want to say thank you to that. Um, so it's very important to know, um, you know, not all hospitals are created equally. Uh, when it comes to Torrance Amora, we are an approved stroke center. So um, we have different credentialing agencies, but we're also approved by L.A. County as well, too. So we're able to receive these patients. Um, we also participate in what we call quality improvement initiatives when it comes to stroke, making sure that we assess, manage, and discharge a patient in an appropriate manner. And um, in 2018, we got our kind of highest award with the American Heart and Stroke Association for that. So it's a big kudos to our, our stroke team to be able to manage our patients. Um, so when it comes to our stroke team specifically, so, you know, we're a nationally and regionally recognized stroke center treating and managing patients who experience a stroke. Uh, our acute stroke multidisciplinary team includes ER physicians, nurses, uh, neurologists, interventional radiologists, um, radiologists, neurosurgeons, pharmacists, and ancillary staff. So rehab, um, lab, there's a bunch of people that are all involved in trying to help manage this patient. So when we look at Torrance Memorial, we provide a comprehensive stroke care from the onset of stroke symptoms uh, through to stroke rehabilitation. 
Uh, so coordination of care from e emergency room physicians all the way up to and including outpatient services on discharge. So we kind of cover all spectrums when it comes to stroke in the hospital and once you get discharged. Um, we do have highly trained expert staff at all levels of stroke care. So there's a lot of studies out there showing that having um, patients managed on units that continually have stroke patients on that are trained in that have better outcomes. So it's nice to know that, that we have that. Uh, we also have some technology that helps us rapidly triage these patients in emergency room or possibly in-house as well too. So we have telestroke capabilities for a kind of rapid assessment and acute neurological symptoms in the ER or inpatient setting. Uh, when it comes to advanced stroke services, we have a dedicated neurointerventional team that helps us uh, with these patients if indicated, and that's 24 7, 365 day coverage. So there's always someone that's going to be answering a call um, if someone is experiencing a stroke and they're indicated for any kind of acute intervention. Um, so these include mechanical thrombectomy, aneurysm embolization, AV malformation embolization, venous, thrin venous sinus thrombosis, and carotid artery stenting, and other neur neurosurgical services in the stroke where we look at our AVM repair hematoma evacuation and cerebral hemodynamic monitoring. And Dr. Eboli will be touching on some of this in our lecture and in our, in our slide deck as well too. Also, uh, what kind of approach do we take to caring for patients while they're in the hospital? I like to think that we have a patient-centered approach, so patient and family are always gonna be at the center of how we treat our, and manage our patients. So like I mentioned, we have our neuro-trained um, RNs and staff and up-to-date stroke treatment and management uh, protocols. So we have our neuro-intensive ICU in our three east and a progressive care unit on 5 West, which is our other stroke unit that we help manage these patients on. So we participate in daily rounding and space patient-specific plans for these uh, cases. Uh, so just a couple program milestones i like to highlight for us. So in 2015 is when we really started to ramp up our thrombectomy capabilities, and uh, Dr. Um, Eboli will kind of talk about this in, in detail. And in 2016, we implemented our telestroke program, um, and you can see the little machine right behind Dr. Eboli over there. And 2017, we really started to ramp up our Lundquist Neuro uh, Science Institute and, and, and really diving into our programs here. Uh, in 2018, we had our, our certification with DNB and an aneurysm repair capabilities came on board at that time uh, with the help from our, our Cedar sinai uh, neurosurgical partners. Uh, so talking a little bit about telestroke capabilities. Um, so Torrance and Cedar sinai have an affiliation that brings cutting edge technology and acute stroke management and treatment options to the South Bay via telemedicine services. So you can see that machine right over there. Uh, stroke and vascular neurologists, they can do consults uh, from any location as long as they have cell or Wi-Fi connectivity. Uh, so they could be in clinic, they'll get a page within five minutes or on camera and consulting for this case. And like I mentioned, so time is brain, so that's very important to us. Um, and it actually provides ease of access to nationally recognized clinicians with uh, expertise in stroke diagnosis, treatment, and management. So these are gonna be kind of the top, top people in academic centers being able to triage these patients. Um, so when it comes to telestroke capabilities, also 24-7, 365. So we saw the need for this in our community and felt like it was important to, to, to roll this out for us. So there'll be vascular stroke neurology trained experts. Um, and like I mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago, the consults start in less than five minutes from the time we activate one of our, our code neuros or, or code brains or, or stroke protocols. And these are the great uh, clinicians that'll be on camera. And there may be some of you in this room that have actually seen some of these people uh, on camera at one time or another. So it's nice to know that they're always there for us. All right, and then I'll just uh, show you a quick video uh, about. Everything happened so suddenly. I felt as if a huge wind had just thrown me. So this is a view of Joan's head and I'm making an injection of x-ray fluid, which looks dark. The end of my tube is right about here, and you can see the artery coming up. This is the main artery called the internal carotid artery. It branches, and this is the main branch that supplies the left side of the brain called the left middle cerebral artery, and right here, it is completely blocked. Realized very quickly that uh, this, this is not right because I couldn't move my legs. And the symptoms of a stroke can be anything from sudden onset of loss of function of an arm or a leg, loss of vision, difficulty or inability to speak. Or all of a sudden, your coordination is off and you cannot walk. That is a trigger for a 911 call. 
The next thing I knew, the paramedics had arrived. It was going to disable her for life, uh, if she would even survive it. Uh, she was older, and so a stroke like that can be very devastating. As soon as a patient is brought to the emergency room, the emergency room physician notices the stroke symptoms. They're getting some history that the patient had the start of the symptoms within a treatment time window. I was able to quickly evaluate her, look at the CT images, which showed this complete blockage. We immediately knew that she had what we describe as a left MCA syndrome, so a blood clot most likely lodged into the left side of her brain. She immediately needed to go for something called mechanical thrombectomy, which is a fancy term for removing a blood clot that's blocking that artery. It's very important to get the blood flow back as quickly as possible because you can lose up to two million neurons a minute. Time is brain, and so every minute counts. Everyone knows this, so everyone's working fast and in parallel. So as soon as the CT angiogram is ordered, behind the scenes, Dr. Krothammer is calling the anesthesiologist, calling the technologist in, the nursing team that is all needed to help treat this patient. They've developed basically what we call a scent on a wire or a scent retriever. And that's basically just like the little scents they put out in the heart artery, but it's attached to a little thin wire. And so that goes out in the brain, in the, in the artery that has the blood clot. We let it slowly open up and grab the clot, and then we pull the wire, and we also use suction, and we get that clot out as fast as we can. After we pulled the blood clot out, we made the same injection in the same artery, and now we can see this tangle of blood vessels filling, and these are the normal arteries that are filling the brain. Often a lot of high-fiving going on as soon as we see the clot out and we can see the patient's immediate responses. Kind of similar, I can say this because I've witnessed my wife have a baby, but everything is quiet in the room and there's a bunch of movement going around, but the one minute or the one second that that baby actually makes that scream is a very similar sensation that we get once we see the patient moving and or the clot retrieved. So it's very exciting to be able to walk into a room after all she's been through in the last three days uh, to review the images, review the test results, review her rehabilitation and realize that she's made almost 100% recovery and to be able to tell her that she is no longer needed to be in the hospital. This patient went from a, a devastating stroke scale to, to essentially normal. This is why I'm doing this. This is why I love what I do. It all happened like a dream, and uh, the care was just so wonderful. I had the nurses were just terrific. When you have a stroke, you want to go to a place that can really take care of you. That means we have physicians here 24-7 who can assess your stroke and determine what care you need. We have imaging services here 24-7, uh, CT scans, uh, MRIs, angiographies, whatever we need to take, uh, find out what's going on with your, with your stroke. And we have coverage all around the clock to make sure that we can take care of you. A pharmacist that can mix TPA, a uh, therapist that can see you. And that's very important because you need the whole team to be able to take care of someone having a stroke and we have those services here. When I'm on that patio, I can almost see Torrance Memorial Hospital and that's very reassuring. I will never forget everything that they did for me. And God bless you all and continue with the good work. So I just want to highlight one of our cases that we had here at Torrance Memorial and kind of all the technology and everything coming together in order to treat that patient. And then I'll let Ed talk for just a few minutes talking about our, um, our Lundquist Neuroscience Institute and our partnership with Cedar sinai Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Marco, for that wonderful presentation. And uh, as you can see, the alliance between uh, Torrance Memorial and Cedar sinai is being a tremendous impact on our hospital and our community. Uh, I've been a nurse here for almost 15 years, and I can easily say the last one or two years since this partnership with Cedars has seen the most significant transformations in the care being delivered here at Torrance Memorial. So as another example of the benefits of this alliance, uh, I'm truly honored to present to you our, our next guest speaker, Dr. Paula Eberle. Uh, she's recently came to us by way of Cedars. Uh, she's helping us get to the forefront of neurosurgery here at Torrance Memorial. So we're for, so fortunate for, 
for, to have her here today, tell us more about the exciting advancements. Uh, she's spearheading our, as our newest Torrance Morrow neurosurgeon. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Paula Ebley. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I have a little bit of a cold, so if I drink some water, you know, just understand that. So, um, as Ed said, I'm Dr. Evely. I'm one of the new doctors here. I am um, from Cedar Sinai, but I'm based here at Torrance 24 7. And I wanted to take uh, this opportunity to show you a little bit of what our goal, our mission, and our vision we have for this hospital and essentially for the Lundquist Neuroscience Institute. So, <clears throat> the Lundquist Neuroscience Institute was created a year ago or so, and essentially it's one of those areas at Torrance that really benefited from the alliance with Cedar Sinai. We work together, physicians from Cedars, physicians from Torrance, all the, the team, we, we, we don't care. We're here at Torrance to make it great. And essentially, Cedar sinai is providing mostly like neurosurgery coverage. We provide the 24-hour telestroke with that machine there, and we work together with the people here at Torrance that also provide the interventional um, thrombectomy like you saw in the video. So our teams are mixed, but the most important thing is that we are all together and we all want to make this place great. So I just divided my, my presentation a little bit in two parts. I want to talk a little bit about the Lundquist Neuroscience Institute, what are the things that we're doing and why we're doing them, and then we're going to go and see a few cases. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about stroke, aneurysms, and brain tumors, and about like the things that we do right now. So for the Lundquist Neuroscience Institute, our goal is to provide the state-of-the-art neurological and neurosurgical care. So there are a couple of things that we have here at Torrance that are very, very important in order for us to be able to provide that type of care. One of those things is the dedicated neuro ICU. And <clears throat> ICU means intensive care unit, and that means that we have neurocritical care doctors that are actually ICU doctors, and they are specialized in treating all the patients with neurological diseases. So this is great because we do procedures, but before and after we have really good expertise to take care of our patients. We also have, as we mentioned, the telestroke neurology unit that's provided by the Cedar sinai physicians, and that's a 24-7 thing. We do have also the latest surgical technology here, and we're actually buying more things in order to make our uh, OR rooms even better than they are. Among those things that we are buying, it's um, what we call uh, image guidance systems, uh, microscope. We do have that, but we're gonna get new ones because our team is expanding and growing. And then also we have new instruments, new devices, and for the future, we're planning into bringing robotic into neurosurgery. And I'll, I'll talk about all these things during the presentation so you have a better idea of what everything means here. So the way we're structuring our institute it, we're kind of dividing the institute in different subspecialties for us to be able to cover all the subspecialties within neurosurgery. So we have vascular neurosurgery, which we talk a lot during this meeting because it's a stroke, and we are able to do what we call open procedures, which is more traditional kind of surgery, as well as endovascular procedures, which is more like a minimal invasive surgery. We have a spine uh, neurosurgery area, which we will focus on minimal invasive spine, spinal deformity, and of course, you know, the, the usual like spine procedures like kind of discectomies and more simple things. Then we have the area of the brain tumors. This is a very important area for us too. And this area, it's growing and we have a multidisciplinary approach. We have neuro-oncologists. That means those are doctors that actually treat brain tumors and that's their specialization. So they're coming from Cedar sinai in order to treat 
uh, brain tumor patients here at Torrance. And we work together with the Cancer Institute here at Torrance. We have the brain tumor board. We work with the oncologist and the radiation oncologist. And then for the pituitary tumors, we are also having a multidisciplinary approach. We do them in a minimally invasive fashion through a little camera through the nose. And that's a combination of us as neurosurgeons, the ENT doctors that do the approach, and the endocrinologist. So we all work together as a team just to give the best care to the patients. Then um, movement disorders, which is kind of the the specialty that takes care of like Parkinson's and essential tremors, that means we do surgery for those patients when they fail their, their medical management. And that surgery is called deep brain stimulation. And we don't have it right now, but this is one area that we're developing. And we will have it, I would say, within the next year or so. We'll be doing that surgery here at Torrance, too. And then the neurosurgical research component, that's also something that we are both working together with CEDARS in order to bring here the clinical trials and the new medications that are available for the patients there in order to have it for the patients here at Torrance so they don't have to go down to CEDARS to be involved in any sort of clinical trial. So that was a little bit about our Lundquist Neuroscience Institute. And now I'm just going to talk to you and explain you a little bit about the stroke, what is a stroke, the different type of strokes. And you already heard quite a lot about it. But essentially, there are two main type of strokes. One is an ischemic stroke, and the other one is a hemorrhagic stroke. So ischemic stroke is when you have a blockage, and those are the ones that are amenable to thrombectomy and to the medication to dissolve the clot, which is called the TPA. And I'll talk about thrombectomy, and I'll try to show you how we do it so you understand exactly the devices that we use. And then the hemorrhagic stroke, it's like a bleed inside your brain. And that's also another type of stroke. It's also an emergency. And that one, depending on what caused that bleed, we treat it also with traditional surgery or through endovascular procedures. So I'll explain both of this. So we talk about the thrombectomy procedures, and uh, this is just for you to know which patients are eligible for that thrombectomy procedure. Not every patient that having a stroke can have a thrombectomy. So which patients are the ones that can actually benefit from this procedure are the ones that we call large vessel occlusion, or LVO. So that means that, um, let me see. And there's a clot in one of the main arteries that goes to the brain. So I don't know if you see my arrow there. Maybe not that much. Maybe I can do this pointer. So right there, any clot that it's on a major artery, those are the ones that are potential candidates for a thrombectomy. So here you have a CTA, and that's what we call a CAT scan, but with some dye, we're able to see all the blood vessels. So it's a good way for us to know whether there's a clot or not. And that, on that big white arrow here, you can see that cutoff that we were talking about during the video. So on the other side, you see like the artery goes really nice and out, but here there's really a cutoff. So then from here, we go to this image. This image is called a perfusion. So it tells us how much blood is going actually to the brain. And it's very nice and colorful, and it makes it easier for us to interpret. So the purple thing, it's already a, an area that has stroked out. And the green stuff, it's the area that's at risk for a stroke if we don't do the thrombectomy. So the patients that are actually going to be a candidate for a thrombectomy are those that have like a small purple area but a large green area. If those two areas are exactly the same size, then we don't bring them for a thrombectomy because there's not really much tissue that we can save. So when we do the thrombectomy, the thrombectomy is done in a angio suite, which is something similar to this thing here. So we have the table where we place the patient. We have big monitors where we see all these arteries and we see the procedures that we do. And this is x-ray guided technology. So these are two x-rays. One is here, one is here. It's called a biplane. It's just that, you know, lets us work in AP and lateral views at the same time. So a thrombectomy when the patients are a candidate, this is kind of what we do. And this is just a little drawing for you to understand. So this is the blood vessel here. 
This is the clot that is obstructing the blood vessel. And this is a little wire that we actually advance this wire all the way through the groin that we do a puncture. And we advance it past the clot, distally to the clot. And then we, over the wire, we advance this called microcatheter, also past the clot. And then after that, we advance that stent retriever that you are seeing on the video, which is actually collapsed within that little microcatheter. And as you heard, the stent is attached to the wire, so it's not detachable. So then we kind of unsheath the stent. So we pull the microcatheter back, and then you see how the stent starts to open. And when it opens, it incorporates the clot inside. So that's when we wait for around five minutes or so and let it like kind of sink and get around the clot, uh, the clot. And then we just go ahead and this is just a little bit of motion. That's why it doesn't look that well. But the stent is right here and the clot is inside. So once we pull the whole system out, we bring the clot out with us. And this is one of the things that we do. And we also do an aspiration technique, which I'll show you in the next slide. So this is a case just for you to have a better idea. So this patient is a 56-year-old male that had atrial fibrillation. That's one of the irregular heartbeats, and that's a very common cause for a stroke. So this patient came with some acute onset of left-sided weakness. He couldn't talk, and he had some neglect. And this patient came within two hours, so he was a candidate for IV TPA. And when the patients are candidates for IV TPA, even if they're going to have a thrombectomy, we still give the medication because they both work together. So here is the initial head CT. And here, in this area there, that is a stroke already. So you can see how it's more dark than the rest of the brain. So we know that the patient already has a, a stroke there, which is not very large. And this is the perfusion scan. And this is a little bit of an older version than the one you saw before, so that's why it looks a little different. But this area here is the one that's at risk. So it's a way more larger area at risk than the actual stroke that the patient has. So then we brought them to the angel suite, and these are the kind of images that we see. This, we work with these type of images here. So here, you can see where the clot is, just the cutoff. And more than anything else, we like following the arteries all the way out, and then you follow this one out, and then this one, it just stops. So we know there's a clot there. And this area that you see here, you see there are no blood vessels inside. You see how all the rest one has all these little blood vessels here? There's nothing. So we know this area is the one that's suffering from the stroke. So this is just a little video here. And let me see. Oh, it's plain. So this is how we work. That's the wire. That's the little catheter. We advance that little catheter past the clot. And then there's a bigger catheter right here. You see how much bigger this one is? And this is called an aspiration catheter. So this catheter is actually hooked up to an aspiration pump and we just suction the clot out. So we have those two options. We can either go ahead and suction the clot out, or we can place a stent retriever to remove the clot. And we use both techniques. We use whatever works. We really want the clot out any way or the other. But you can see the size of the catheter is a pretty sizable catheter. So this is the pre and the post. Here is where we had the clot. Here it's after, and you can see nice filling of the arteries. So that clot was removed. So this is the head CT after. So we knew he had a little bit of a stroke here, and we can see that the stroke is slightly bigger. Maybe this area is new, but the area that was at risk was from here to here. So it's way smaller than expected. You know, sometimes despite us doing our best and despite the cloud coming out, you still get some sort of stroke, but usually most of the times it's way smaller than it would have been if the cloud was not retrieved. So here is another case just for you to have another example of what we do. This was a 71-year-old man. He woke up. He was hemiplegic. That means that he couldn't move his arm and his leg, and he couldn't talk. But this was six hours out. So he was not a candidate for the medication. But for the thrombectomy, which is the procedure, we can do it all the way out to 24 hours. So that's a great big window, because these patients are actually 
what we call wake up strokes, which are the patients that went to bed and they w woke up with a stroke. We don't know when that actually happened. And you always have to go back to the last time the patient was known well. So most of the times that is like six, seven, eight hours, or even a little more than that. So it's good that this procedure allows us to go all the way out to 24 hours. And on some selected patients, we can go even a little further than that. So same here, this is the CT perfusion. You can see this area here. It's like this one is red and this one is more blue. That's the area that's at risk for the stroke. And this patient really didn't have a big stroke on the, on the CT. And then here is what we call the CT angiogram where you can see all the blood vessels one more time. And here you see this white spot sometimes when it's a big clot, we can see something like that. We can see a white spot and that indicates there's a clot there. This patient was a little bit more complex because the patient had two clots, one in the carotid and one distally here. So essentially we brought this patient to the angio suite and you can see this is the artery here and just stops, like really dramatically stops. This is the artery that goes to your eye, that's the eye there. And right after the takeoff of this artery, there's a huge stop. And this will be a major stroke because it includes both the MCA, which is the, the one that goes to that side, and the ACA, which goes to this side. So this would be a really, really big stroke. So essentially, we went up with that aspiration catheter that you saw before. We parked the aspiration catheter here. We aspirated, and after that, everything was open. And then on the post-op CT, as I told you many times, you do see some sort of stroke. Oh. There you go, sorry. But here you see a small stroke. It's just this tiny little stroke. The patient did very well, and after a couple of weeks was able to return to work. So these are really good results that we're getting for, from these procedures. So moving into a different area, this is um, brain aneurysm. This is more in the side of the hemorrhagic strokes. So it's like a bleed inside the head. So a brain aneurysm, I don't know if you know what it is, but it's essentially a weak area on the blood vessel inside the brain and it gets kind of dilated like a balloon. So essentially it looks like something like that, very rounded. And these are like normal arteries and right in between them you see that aneurysm there. Most of the times, unless the aneurysms are really big and they're pushing on a nerve or any vital structure, they're gonna be asymptomatic and they will become symptomatic once they bleed. So once they bleed, which is what happens here, it just bursts and bleeds and then that's when the patient becomes really symptomatic. So the bleed usually will be in an area that we call subarachnoid bleed. So if you see the coverings of the brain, this is the arachnoid membrane here, and we call subarachnoid because it's just underneath that cover where the blood vessels are. So it's called a subarachnoid hemorrhage, the one that you have from a brain aneurysm. And this is a very life-threatening condition. 40% of the patients will survive the initial bleed, from those ones that survive, like 60% will have some sort of neurological deficit. And um, the potential complications, even though if we go ahead and treat the brain aneurysm, you can still get on kind of a delay fashion complications like a coma or a stroke or what we call vasospasm, which is narrowing of the arteries of the brain. So this is a very... Um, condition that's very hard to treat and the prognosis, it really depends on the treatment that you get, not only when you treat the aneurysm itself, but for the next ten, seven to 10 days that you're gonna be in the ICU with neurocritical care. So everything takes into play for the prognosis for this type of patient. So what treatments do we have for these? We have two type of treatments that we have it available here at Torrance. One treatment is the classic, what we call neurosurgical treatment, which is open surgery. And essentially what we do, we go in, the patient goes to the traditional um, OR, and then what we do, we do a little window on the bone, and we go ahead and go 
kind of dissecting the brain in order to find this aneurysm. Once we find it, we put a little clip here, and once we clip it, the aneurysm is excluded from the circulation so it cannot bleed anymore. So that's one treatment. The other treatment, it's in the angio suite, like I showed you before with the x-ray, and that's the minimally invasive one. And these ones are the ones that we use like a little catheter like you saw in the picture before, but this time the catheter will go into the aneurysm and through this little catheter we deploy some coils inside the aneurysm and then the aneurysm gets filled with these coils so it doesn't bleed anymore. And same, in, same principle as the clip, all you want to do is just have the circulation go this way and not into the aneurysm. So this is an example of a patient that actually had a rupture aneurysm. This is a patient that was seen in the outside place, and you can tell here that there has been surgery. They went in the outside hospital, they went in and tried to evacuate this bleed. Whenever you see white on these CAT scans, this is a hematoma or blood. And so they went in, they partially evacuated this bleed, and then they transferred the patient just to get higher level of care. So when the patient got the angiogram, you can see this is just, this is not saddle, so it's good for people to, to see what it is. So this is a giant aneurysm here. This is really, really very large. So essentially what we do is what I told you. We go with that tiny little catheter, we put it inside, and we start filling the aneurysm with coils. So this is how the aneurysm looks, all these, things like inside, it's all the coils are packed inside the aneurysm to prevent it from re-bleeding. This patient had multiple brain aneurysms, so let me show you this thing here. That is another brain aneurysm because you see how the vessels are nice and smooth, and this thing really, it's very ugly. So that's another brain aneurysm. And here, there's another brain aneurysm. So usually when the vessels divide, it's very clean and there's nothing there, but here they divide like here and here, and right there you have another aneurysm. So the good thing about the treatment through the groin is that you can place the catheter in all these aneurysms and just go ahead and coil all of them. So we went in, we put coils here, so kind of you can only see the shadow of the coils, but the aneurysm is not feeling anymore, and this is, when we started to coil this one. So we continue to coil and coil and coil until you see it like that. There's no blood flow. And then you prevent all these aneurysms from bleeding. So moving on into a different area, I wanted to tell you a little bit of what our surgery suites are and how technology is helping us to treat all these patients and all the neurosurgical patients. The neurosurgical area, it's very on hand with technology. We really uh, benefit from having these devices here, and we do have these at Horan. So this is what we call an image-guided navigation system, and this is like a GPS for the brain, and essentially what we usually use it for most of the times is for bleeds inside the brain that we're gonna go and remove or for brain tumors that we wanna go and remove. So it works with an MRI, it has a little camera, and it's like an optical system. So what it does, you have your pointer here with these little kind of balls there and this thing, and everything talks to each other, this to this and then to the camera, and then if you see here, that's a dummy head, and she has a pointer there, and then you can see the pointer right there, so you know exactly where in the brain with the MRI you are. And with these, you plan all your approaches and all your tumor resections in order to do it safe and not to get lost because you can do things in a different angle and you wouldn't reach the, the tumor. So this navigation system works together with a microscope and this is what we use to operate on patients. These are lesions that are very, very tiny, so we used a lot of magnification in order for us to be very delicate and be able to remove them. So 
everything talks to each other. So the microscope has those little balls here. You have the camera and everything is communicating. So essentially what we can see through the microscope is something similar to what you see here on the screen. This is the brain tumor there. And I mean, it's like the contours of the brain tumor. That's what we see. And these are what we call the tracts of the brain. Those are fibers that connect different areas of the brain. And we can see that too. And we, when we go in, we avoid those fibers and we go straight to the tumor. So for example, for these type of cases, this is an intracerebral hemorrhage, which means a bleed inside the head. And this is a hemorrhagic stroke, and this is something that now we're treating. In the past, we didn't used to be able to treat, but now we have minimal invasive techniques that can get us safe into the area where the bleed is and go ahead and remove it. So essentially, most of the times, the bleeds will increase with time. So the patient gets the initial head CT, maybe it looks this size, most of the times it's gonna get bigger. This is something that it's actually a very um, kind of common for strokes, is 15% of all strokes. This is more common than the brain aneurysm bleed, and it's a very devastating disease with a very, very high mortality. So what we do, we have different devices in order for us to be able to treat these kind of bleeds. This is called the Artemis device, and this is a pump. And this is the, actually the suction pump that we use to suck the stroke, the clot. We use the same pump in surgery room to suction the clot, but inside the head, like the bleed. So we go in with this little device, which is like a suctioning device, and we go in with an endoscope and we look at the, at the clot and then we hook it up to this suction device and we suction the clot out. This system has a little bit of some limitations because we cannot really maneuver. Like let's say if we need to uh, do like what we call hemostasis, which is like stopping the bleed, it's very hard to do it with this system. So I'd rather use this one here that it's called the brain path, but we have several different types of systems that actually they're like what we call tubular retractors. So this is a retractor that it goes inside the head. And this is here. Here is the craniotomy, which is the bony window. That's the, the bone. These are the coverings of the brain, which are called the dura. And this is actually the brain here. So usually most of the time the bleed is very deep. So we go in with that navigation system, with the GPS system to know exactly where we're going. We introduce this tubular retractor. We introduce it all the way inside the brain. Once it's all the way in, if you look here, that's the blood clot. So we go in with a suction device, which is this thing here, and we suction that clot out. And if we see any active bleeding, we can take care of that. If we see a brain tumor, we can take care of that. If we see any malformation, we can take care of that. So that's why I like this uh, device. And then you just take it out, and it just leaves like very nice plane. And essentially, it, it is designed to go th through the fibers, like opening them apart and no transecting them. So it just it minimi minimizes the damage that it does to the brain. So another nice thing that we have, and this is a combination with the imaging department, with the MRI, we can get what we call MRI tractography. And that is those fibers that I was talking to you about. Those are the connection between like really areas that make a lot of function in the brain. So for example, when their motor area goes down, this is the motor track. So you wanna avoid that because even if you're not gonna hurt the motor area, if you hurt the track, the connection, you're still gonna give the patient some deficit. So essentially what this allows us to do is to treat all these deep lesions, which are either brain tumors or bleeds. And in a way that when we plan our trajectory, we avoid these major tracks. So for example, we can do, this is all virtual reconstruction and this is actually very useful for us. So we have reconstruction here of the tumor and then you have reconstruction of all the fibers and then this is your plan trajectory. So then you, you know exactly where to go to this lesion, avoiding all these areas and also not getting lost and ending up here or here. We know exactly where we are going. So this is another tool that's very useful for us. So here you have 
one of these tubular retractors that we use here. And this is a brain tumor lesion here. This is the virtual reconstruction. These are all the tracks. And then this is the trajectory that we plan in order to go in there and remove the tumor very safely. So you can see this tumor is pretty deep, but we go in here with minimal damage straight to that lesion. In the past, we just did it like opening and suctioning, but sometimes it just, the angle, it just gets lost a little bit and you just miss the lesion and that's not really good. So same thing as the other device that I show you, it goes all the way in and then through this little window, you go in and you remove the tumor with your suctioning and this is the bipolar just to cauterize the arteries if there's any bleed. So this is another case here. This is a young lady, 57 year old, that presented um, to the emergency room with some altered mental status and she has history of hypertension and she got an MRI initially and they thought he, she had a brain tumor because they saw this thing here. This thing is definitely abnormal and it looks like there's some bleed in that area. And many times when we do an MRI, it's hard for us to tell whether this is just a bleed or it's a bleed, a brain tumor that actually bled. So essentially this is a sequence on the MRI that with, with the, the portion that's dark will show you all the areas that there's quite a lot of blood. So this is quite a large hemorrhagic lesion. So this is the CT, uh, the CT, and as I told you, on the CT, it's a little easier to spot the blood. So the white thing, it's all blood. But it's hard to tell whether this is just blood or it's, it's a brain tumor within it. So every time we have these type of lesions when there's a large bleed, we do that CT and geography to look at the blood vessels to make sure there's not really a malformation, an abnormal vessel on the brain that actually bled. And here we really don't see that. We only see the clot. And so we don't know if this is a, just a bleed, this is a bleed with brain tumor, it's hard for us to tell. So that's why I was telling you that the device that we choose is the one that we can actually do both. We can take the clot and if there's a brain tumor, we can take it out because with the endoscopic one, we cannot remove brain tumors. So we went in with that minimal invasive device and this is after. So most of the clot is out. There's always some residual clot, but we are not really that worried about because this will go away on its own. But the major clot with the mass effect, it's gone. And you can barely tell our path because this thing just dissects and then when you take it out, the brain comes back together. So we don't remove brain in order to get there. So it, you can even barely see our track in order to get to that lesion. So our future goals, and this is um, something that's still developing, and it might be out, I would say, in a year or so. This is robotics. This is like cobots, the robots that assist us. So this is from the Brain Lab company, which is kind of the navigation system. So this will also talk to that GPS machine. You see those little balls. So when you see the balls, everything talks to each other. So. This is a robotic arm for neurosurgery. And so far we don't do much uh, robotic surgery, but when we get this robot, we will start doing that. And you can see here, this is a, a spine, like a dummy for the spine. So essentially it will be very, very useful to do like spine instrumentation, which means like placing screws inside the spine. And the main reason why it's because you can track all your trajectories like virtually, and then the robot will just position there and not move at all. So your angle, it's gonna be perfect because the robot is gonna be the one giving you the angle. Right now we do it hand. So once we have the robot there, just you, all you do is like through this canal, you introduce like the drill, the screw, and everything goes in the planned trajectory. So this is very accurate and we're hoping to get it once it's out. This is also going to be useful for our deep brain stimulation surgery, which is the one, as I told you, for Parkinson's or for tremors, because it's the same principle. We plan our trajectory, and then the robot just fix it there, and we can, through this little hole, introduce the leads, which are called stimulators, for us to treat those diseases. Right now, they are done with a big halo, and the patient has to be awake with a big halo. So this is way less invasive. So this is the way we, we are gonna go here for this type of surgery. And then 
Our future goals that we have, as I mentioned before, is the research and the clinical trials. So we're going to bring and share all our research and all our cl clinical trials here at Florence that we have going on at CEDAR. So that, I think it's a great thing that we can offer. So just to conclude, I wanted to tell you what we have done so far and the things that we do have right now available. So I guess you already heard this, but we have the 24-7 neurosurgery and stroke coverage, which is really very important for us to treat any patient with any sort of stroke that comes to the ED, because we have the open and the endovascular capability to take care of those patients. As I told you, we have the neurocritical care intensive unit, which is something that really set things apart and makes a huge difference in the outcome of the patients. We have the nurses with the expertise on neurosurgical care. We have the nurses that are coordinators and that take care of our stroke program, and that's a lot of work because every Everything that we do for these stroke patients, it's timed. We look into all the things that we do, all the steps that we take, how we can improve it. So that takes a lot of work and effort. Then we have this transcranial Doppler capability, and this is a special Doppler that we use for patients that actually bled inside the head from an aneurysm, and it's for us to know whether they're having like cramping of the vessels inside the head. And if that's the case, then we can go and treat them. So this is something very important because if we don't have this, then we cannot bring patients with brain aneurysms. Then, as I showed you, we are able to do right now the minimal invasive procedures for brain tumors. We're able to do the minimal invasive procedures for um, bleeds inside the head. And we also have a dedicated Cedar sinai neurosurgery clinic right here at Torrance where the neuro-oncologists are also seeing patients. And then just to conclude, as I told you initially, our goal here and our vision and our mission and our commitment is to provide world-class neuroscience care here at Torrance Memorial Medical Center. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now have about a 10 minute break during which time members of the Miracle of Living Committee will be passing among you, uh, passing out paper and pencils for those who need them and collecting questions to be asked up here after the break. Thank you. And now if we can, please take your seats and we'll begin. I have quite a few questions here. I hope to be able to get to all of them. Uh, let's start with this one. What if you are noticing with a friend and notice the signs, all the signs, and you're hiking three miles from a road or you're out on a boat 45 minutes from shore, what do you do? So, so the scenario is you're three miles from the road? You're, you're a long way from any medical help. You're a, an hour away from any possible help. What do you do? Well, hopefully you have cell phone service. That'll be the main thing. You always want to call 911. And you know the uh, EMS agencies will find a way to try and, and locate you. So uh, there are different variety of options to help with that. But you know, um, if you're out hiking or somewhere far away, hopefully you have cell phone service. That'll be kind of your best bet. A couple of questions about carotid artery blocking. Uh, one, one of my carotid arteries is totally blocked. Is it affecting my brain activity? And a related question, does blockage in carotid arteries contribute to stroke risk? Well, yeah, they, they actually do. So that's why if you do have a carotid blockage, the best thing if it hasn't thrown any clots or caused any strokes to get with medical management, we are noticing now that the maximum medical management does really good things for carotid blockages. And then if you have one carotid block, then most of the times the blood supply from the other side, it's enough to give you uh, blood supply to the brain and shouldn't affect your thinking. But there are tests that we can do in that case to see how much flow is going to the, to the brain. Um, okay, how does filling an aneurysm with the platinum coil stop the aneurysm from bleeding? 
more than anything else, we want to exclude the inners in from the circulation. So once there's no blood going in, that just prevents it from bleeding. So it's just filling the ball with something, and then the blood wouldn't go that direction. So that's kind of the principle. Um, related question on the same sort of treatment. Uh, are there some side effects to this treatment? Uh, the person who submitted the question has a friend who underwent the treatment and now this blood circulation problem is okay, but she has double vision. Is this common? Well, yeah, it is common. It, it all depends on what kind of symptoms you come into. And essentially, you can have the neurological symptom from the bleed, like the double vision. And what we do when we treat, we prevent it from re-bleeding, but we actually don't uh, treat the double vision per se, if that is clear. And then, of course, there are potential risks and potential complications from these type of procedures. And there's always a risk for a stroke every time we go in and do these things. So that can be something that happened too. Uh, you've mentioned robotic surgery being done. Uh, is it, or is it being done anywhere presently in the US or is it everywhere in the future? Well, this cobot that we saw, this one is in the future. There are some uh, robots, and I believe there are places that are using it. That's a different uh, brand that's called Mazer, and they use it mainly for spine and for deep brain stimulation, but not, not many places. Okay, thank you. Uh, is a TIA, that stands for transient ischemic attack, uh, let me show off a little bit there, uh, a form of a stroke and is rapid response also recommended for TIAs? Yes, it is, and yeah, the best thing you can do is just get the rapid response, and there's treatment for that, and the most important thing is to get treated right away to prevent it from happening again or becoming a stroke. How does a stroke differ from an epileptic seizure? The person asking the question takes Dilantin to control the seizures. Does the Dilantin also help to prevent strokes? Uh, no, the dilantin doesn't help to prevent strokes. Um, if, let's say most of the times the stroke will kind of come with some sort of symptoms like numbness, weakness, facial thing. It can potentially be a seizure, but that's not the most common symptoms for, for stroke. But let's say if you're having a seizure from a stroke, you wouldn't be able to tell if the seizure is from a stroke or from epilepsy. So either um, situation you come here, we do a, a scan and with that we can tell well, what's going on? Uh, one of the um, letters in your acronym, the last one was T for time. Uh, is there a time limit on the success possibility? In other words, if you exceed a certain time limit, uh, is the game over um, in calling an ambulance? Would you care to comment? Yeah, so when we look at time and that B fast acronym, um, when it comes to thrombolytic therapy or IVTP or the clot buster, we only have a window up to four and a half hours from last known well. Um, but it's very vital that as soon as you recognize symptoms to call 911 immediately. Like we had mentioned before, uh, you lose about two million neurons per minute during acute ischemic stroke. So the sooner you come to the hospital, the sooner we can treat you, the better the outcomes hopefully will be. And uh, there was a second part to that question. Uh. Simply, would you care to comment? Oh, oh. you have commented. I believe. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. And no, it's not game over because we can do a thrombectomy up to 24 hours. So you're always better off coming, even if it's been like four and a half hours. And the, even if you're not a TPA candidate, you're not a thrombectomy candidate. There's still some things that we can do for you. Okay, now tell us all about 81 milligrams of daily aspirin, good or bad. I think it's good. Most of the times, yeah, it prevents cardiovascular array and stroke. Didn't get any of that. Sorry, I think it's good. It's a good preventive for cardiovascular and stroke after a certain age. Usually 50s. Um, uh, this is a question about augmented reality or virtual reality. Do you use that in training uh, and for exp experiences of what the patient might be undergoing uh, as part of your training, simulating their experience? Yeah, the, ideally we do um, use it in training, but um, at some point you, you get to the point in your training that you actually need to do 
a real patient because this uh, is something that requires a lot, a lot of training. It's not something that we, we can unfortunately kind of train in virtual reality because there's a difference when you're actually doing those procedures versus when you're just in the, in the computer playing with it. But yes, we use it initially, but then the training has to evolve into real cases. I have another regarding epilepsy. Are you doing are you doing surgery for epilepsy patients that may be helped by this? Yeah, epilepsy is one of those areas that I anticipate we're still going to be doing then at Cedars because it requires a big team. The number of patients with epilepsy that actually require surgery is very small. So I would say for now, if there's a patient that needs epilepsy surgery, we're going to send that patient to Cedars. We can see the patient before and after, but surgery itself will be at Cedars Sinai. When uh, there, why do why do you drain blood from the brain anyway? Is I suppose it's to relieve pressure, but let me get the yes. medical answer to that. And and this is something that we have a very like straightforward conversation with the pa with the patient's family and taking into account the patient's wishes. And more than anything else, is like when you have a bleed in the brain, the damage that the bleed already caused, we cannot fix that. But then there's a secondary damage from the pressure and from the swelling and from the edema around that bleed. And that's the thing that we target. You know, many times if we don't operate, this is a complete devastating disease that the patients don't survive. If we operate, then at least we give them the chance and see how they do. And some patients recover functionality, some of them don't recover functionality. Um, here is a person who is 61 years old, feels head shaking when watching televisions and sitting still. I do not feel anything throughout the day or night. Is there some test I can take to figure out what's going on? With the head shaking? Um, yeah, I would see neurology. That looks like a kind of a movement disorder thing. So I, I don't do neurology, but yeah, I would definitely go ahead and see a neurologist. Uh, is Torrance Memorial designated as A, a comprehensive stroke center, or B, a primary stroke center? So currently uh, in LA County, we are designated as a comprehensive stroke center, so we can receive um, patients in that realm. Um, as far as certification, we're certified by uh, what's called Det Norse Veritask. They're our credential agency, and we're a primary uh, plus stroke center. So what we consider that's thrombectomy capable, if you've ever heard that designation but we do take uh, the highest level of stroke patients in the hospital. Uh, we're on the pathway to becoming comprehensive as well too. So. Do statins that pass the brain barrier play into a person having dementia? I'm not 100% sure, I don't wanna lie to you. So yeah, I don't do dementia. Um, I occasionally have tingling in the right side uh, the arm and further down, what should I do? So uh, first of all, you can go and see primary care doctor. They will probably refer you to neurology. And it can be several different things that can give you tingling. It could be like the head, the neck, a peripheral nerve. So it just requires some workup for us to know which area is actually given the tingling. Um, here's a question about glucose level. Um, are there any indications of the glucose history in correlation with uh, stroke onset? So, uh, diabetes is a risk factor for stroke. And in fact, when a patient does in fact have a stroke too, uh, higher blood sugars inside the hospital do lead to poor patient outcomes. So it's always nice to try and keep that managed while they're in the inpatient setting as well. But diabetes uh, or high blood sugar is a, is a risk factor for stroke. Are there any symptoms of an aneurysm? How could this be detected before it begins to bleed? Well, if the aneurysm is small, usually most of the times there are no symptoms. Uh, some patients do experience a prior headache before it actually bleeds. That's called a sentinel headache. So if you have like an abnormal headache, then you can go ahead and check it out and see if it is indeed an aneurysm. If it's the aneurysm is fairly large and is close to um, an area that is, would, would, give, would give you some symptoms, then potentially you can get some symptoms, but it would be more unusual. Most of the times, they're completely asymptomatic. And right now, uh, it's not a routine for doctors to scan just to see if there's a brain aneurysm. The insurance wouldn't approve that. 
Um, do you work with and can you help Huntington chorea disease patients? I don't know. You can yeah, tell us no, what that yeah, is. Yeah, I know of what all. that is. No, that is a neurological disease, again, like movement disorders. So the neurologist will be able to take care of that, yes. Um, I'm not sure whether this is uh, something that should be handled privately or not, but I, I guess it won't be since I will now talk about it. Uh, we have a question a woman whose husband had a stroke and couldn't, couldn't figure out what was ha She was not present, and he couldn't figure out what was happening, and he was told he was outside the uh, window and couldn't have surgery, and I assume that means thrombectomy. Uh, why, under what circumstances can you not perform a thrombectomy? Sometimes, um, if the blood clot is far out on the circulation, we don't perform thrombectomies. That's just too far out for us to reach. So we only do it when it's like a main artery inside the head. So that's probably the situation. It was probably like a more distal clot. And in that case, if you're out of the TPA window, then you're not going to be a candidate for thrombectomy just because the clot is like way far out for us to reach. Not quite sure here. Um, Asking about advancements in the recovery time after a stroke. Uh, this person is a 50-year-old male with uh, motor defects on the right side. Um, our recovery time, I guess the question really is, are there are improvements in recovery time occurring? Essentially what we say most of the times when there's a stroke, up to six months you can expect recovery. For in six months uh, to a year, you will have some sort of recovery, but not as much as the first six months. After the year from the event, you're pretty much where you're going to end up being. And there's this, this last question is not really uh, for the panel so much. It's a question about Torrance Memorial Independent Physicians Association, how one enrolls and so on. I guess perhaps they could help uh, with that at the back of the room. Uh, but you folks are not necessarily uh, conversant with that. So uh, that concludes the questions that we have. Before we adjourn, let me put in a sales pitch for next month. The topic is skin diseases and how to protect your skin. Uh, as usual, it will be the third Wednesday of the month in this room at 7 p.m. I hope to see you all here then. Thank you very much, and thank you to our panel.